Hello, everybody, and welcome to the world's favorite youth baseball podcast, Clearing the Bases, featuring Coach Jimmy Filangieri. I'm David Friedman, and I want to thank you for coming along this ride with us. How are we doing today, Coach? You know, Dave, usually when you ask me that question, the first thing that I usually say is, doing good, Dave. Well, I don't know if I could say that now. <laughs> uh oh. What's yeah. going on? Oh, we're in, we'll call it a, a valley right now that we're trying to climb out of. And you know what? I'm, I'm going to earn my money this year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's about time. Uh, <laughs> so you're uh, referring to your travel team. You are, uh, you know, well up and running with the, the summer season here and having a little bit of trials and tribulations. Yeah, I would say that we're stumbling a little bit to start the season off. So we're trying to work through it. A lot of work to do. And it's just like I said, it's it's a tough start. And to be honest with you, forget about me. I mean, I feel bad for the boys. The boys aren't winning. You know, they're getting down on themselves. Uh, trying to keep that positive atmosphere is difficult when, when you're not playing well. But there's work to be done. And I think there's lessons to be learned. Well, sure, sure. And it's also, I think it's, um, you know, a big challenge at this level. And you're talking about 14 U summer travel ball. Uh, while school is out, of course, most teams try to get in as many games and tournaments as possible, which of course then leads to a lack of practice time. So right. when things are going well, that's fine, but the opposite holds true, of course. Right, right. And that's, well, I mean, we are practicing, we'll say, the normal amount for this time of year. It is difficult with uh, league. Like, like I'll give you an example. For t tomorrow night, we have a, a league game when normally I would be practicing. And we just came off a tournament from this past weekend. So it makes it a little difficult because I would much rather practice tomorrow night. We could use it. It would benefit the team greatly, but we have a game. So yeah, like you said, it's becomes a little hard to try and find that practice time where you could remedy the problems that you're having. Well, yeah, because you look at them, obviously we go through the same thing during the school year where even though we're playing every day, whether it be a game or a practice during the school season, to work on the finite things is where it gets really tough, such as pitching. Most of your pitchers either just pitched or are about to pitch. So how much, how much of a bullpen session can you really work with anybody on any given week? And I think that's where, you know, where if all you were doing, go back to the traditional travel ball where it was just Sunday double headers and then maybe a tournament or two, I'm going back to, as far as my knowledge, my infancy, say maybe 10 years ago, maybe a little bit more than that now, you know, that's basically what it was where you could, you could have a practice on a Wednesday and throw bullpen sessions and really work on, you know, refining things. But if you're playing a game or two during the week, and then you also have either a tournament or a doubleheader on the weekend, he said either either you got to figure you're going to take that kid out of commission for the week, which unless you've got a team of superstars, you probably don't have the arms to do. Right. Right. That's true. Yeah. Or you can't really work on too much other than theory. And exactly. you can work on their mental side of it. But if you can't work on the physical side of it, you're only going to make so much gains. Exactly. Yeah. So we'll, uh, you know, we'll keep our nose to the grindstone and we'll just keep doing what we have to do. And let me put it this way. We're coming off a win. So there's a good start. Well, that's all right. That's all right. Yeah. You know, they, hopefully they, it's something you can build off of going forward. Right. I like the way they held on. It shows promise. And we'll, like I said, we'll just keep working hard and moving forward. That's what we can do. That's all we can do. As a friend of the show, Steve Springer talks about yesterday's gone. Right. All we can do is focus on what's happening in front of us. Right. Tomorrow's opening day again. That's it. That's it. Um, hope springs eternal. So that's great. I think we've got a, a great show lined up today where we want to talk about primarily about team communication 
And this is something we want to look at from a number of different standpoints of both for the school program and the travel program uh, that you're involved in. And then we talk about team communication. That's whether it be with the players, the parents, both we want to talk a little bit about how you should set it up before the season, which to me should be way before the season, not opening day or the night before opening day. Uh, and then during the season, what type of communication that not only you uh, initiate as a coach, but also what you allow from the parents and players. And I know from talking to off air where there's, you know, you certainly have a different uh, perspective on your school team as you do for the travel team. And then uh, after season. You know, what do, what do we do at the end of the season, which, again, wild differences here when we're talking about travel, because what is the end of the season? The end of the season, <laughs> the next weekend is the new season. Right. Um, but for school ball, obviously, the end of the season, there's there's a good hiatus there before you might see some of these kids or most of these kids, uh, you know, months and months will go by. So you want to set them up. You know, how do you set them up for a success? in the future. Right. So um, that's what we want to talk about today. So this is something that we do see on some of the forums. We've gotten some, we've gotten some emails and, uh, and, and tweets, which uh, we can be reached on Twitter at the CTB show. That's at the CTB show on Twitter. Our email address is clearing the bases at gmail.com. Uh, we'd love to hear from you guys. We'd love to interact and we also, obviously, both of us are involved in multiple different Facebook pages and whatnot and, and, uh, and Twitter threads where we talk about coaching and youth development. So these are some topics that definitely come up, and I don't think that they get enough attention because I think it's something that is really, really important in terms of setting expectations and then following through on them. Right. I mean, to, to start off, you know, with... with the subject of communication, all baseball, co well, I shouldn't say all baseball, all coaches, period, have to be good communicators. The best coaches in the business are all good communicators. Just because you're maybe a good X's and O's guy, yeah, you may be a good coach in that aspect, but if you leave out that communication part and you're not a good communicator, chances are you're going to fail. Sure. And this is where we talk about, you know, this is those that do well sometimes aren't the best coaches because they can they can just they can show you, hey, here's how you take a swing. Here's how you throw the ball hard, what have you. But to be able to teach that, to be able to communicate that to the team effectively is a whole different aspect. And then there's also just the interpersonal communication aside from, like you said, the X's and O's part of it but the actual running of the team and whether this is things like positions being played or not being played position in the batting order, um, talking about effort and attitude and things like that with, with the team, again, whether it be as a whole or individually being an effective communicator, I'd say has to be at least as important as being a good drill instructor. Absolutely. And, and the other thing too, as far as the players are concerned, your communication with players varies from player to player. You may handle one player one way and communicate with him in one way and take another player that you might do it totally different. And again, that's part of being a good coach is understanding that and reading that and being able to recognize, you know, Hey, I could talk to this kid this way, but I could talk to this kid that way. And, and that's that I, I believe that's a very big part of it. Sure. To, to certainly to some degree, there's got to be a message to the team in general. And then, yes, part of our jobs as as coaches is to figure out uh, how to reach individual each individual kid. Uh, and there's also a fine line, I think, that we have to walk there before it starts looking at like, oh, well, coach really likes that kid. Look at how he talks to him. And whereas he only yells at me or that type of thing. And that may not be reality but it could certainly be perception. Uh, I've been in that position as a coach before where um, uh, being accused of a parent of always uh, coming down on their kid. 
uh, putting their kid down. And that's something that it's one of the, one of the angriest I, I ever got with, with baseball was feeling, having to defend myself because I said, I've never put a player down. Never. Yeah. I mean, I was going to say, you know, I was going to say, I I've known you for you know a long time and I don't believe that I've ever known you to put a player down. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, that's fine. It's, it's a situation. It was more, it was a situation of, you know, somebody who, didn't pay attention, somebody who didn't put a lot of effort out. So was I hard on that kid? Yes. But Mm -hmm. that's not putting him down. Right. You know, calling somebody out for something they do or don't do is not putting a player down. Right. Of course. You know, I never yelled at a player for letting a ball go through their legs, never yelled at a player for taking a strike three, never, you know, those types of things. You know, that's not, that's, that's not coaching. Right. You know, that's, 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 that's trying to manage players and you can't manage players you you know it's something an old boss of mine uh, one of my first bosses uh, that I ever had as a kid taught me a very very valuable lesson in that you manage things but you lead people Hmm. you know and there's a very distinct difference there and it's something I've tried to hold to for my entire my coaching and my professional career something I believe very very strongly in and if you're not able to lead these kids in the right way, then like we were talking about before, then you're, you're, you're just not going to be an effective coach. You're not going to get those kids wanting to come back the next year, whether it be playing for you or playing for another team, they're going to lose interest real quick. Right. Yeah. It's just something that, that I believe doesn't get talked about enough. You know, the communication part, whether it be with players, parents, umpires, opposing coaches, there's a lot of communication that goes on. When you're when you're a coach, regardless of whether it's baseball or, or any other sport, and it's something that coaches need to understand. They need to I, I was going to use the word master. I was going to say they need to master it, but I, I won't say you need to master it, but you need to be pretty good at it. And you have to have a good understanding of how to do it. Yeah, your goal should be to master it just like anything else. Right. Yeah. So as you work towards that and you get better at it, just like we want our players to get better at picking up on the curveball and getting better at playing off, you know, playing the uh, the short hops and things like that. We need to be better, get better and continually refine our craft in terms of from the coaching aspect, from the communication aspect. I think it's very, very important. So um, so we're, we're, we're jumping around a little bit here. So let's let's go in kind of chronological order. Let's talk about what types of communications we should have with the team. And we can break that down to parents and players, but what type of communication we should have with the team kind of preseason? Okay. What's, what's an ideal scenario for you? Okay, so what I do is I have my initial meeting with players and parents at the same time. The first, first initial I forget what I call it, the preseason meeting, I think I, I call it, but that's, I'll, I'll do it with, with everyone. And I'll go through a litany of subjects in a, like a four page outline. So there's quite a bit of stuff that gets covered. And w- one of the things that I want to let people know is a lot of the stuff that I cover in that meeting, I got a lot of that stuff from and I don't know if anyone has ever heard of this and if you haven't you should it's called the Matheny Manifesto and I use that as a guideline to to formulate my meeting with them with the parents and again people out there if you've never heard of it look it up the Matheny Manifesto um, I know it's something that I'm gonna say I first read about that probably seven or eight years ago and um, basically, it just kind of sets the table for what the expectations are for both you as the coach. And really, this is, I guess it, it's catered towards towards the players, but it's really more, I think, intended for the parents and what their kind of role and responsibility is during the season, right? Right. And Mike Matheny was a former major league player. Then I believe that he wrote that letter in between his playing days and his managing days. So when he stopped playing before he became a major league manager, he, he actually was the head coach for a, I believe it was a 10 year old youth baseball team. And that's when he crafted this letter. And again, it's, it's, 
it's a very, very good guideline for coaches to use to understand really what the goals are, what we're trying to do with these young kids. But I, I don't want to get into, into that too much. I just want people to understand, go online, look it up, Matheny Manifesto, and you know, read it. It's, 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 it's an easy read, and it'll take you a few minutes to read it. It's, it's a good guideline. But anyhow, so when I do my preseason meeting, I started off, and I'm just going to go through a couple of bullet points that I cover, okay? So what I'll do is I will first talk about the players and let the parents know what we are doing and expecting and teaching the players, where I'll use as an example, we do accountability. I'll talk about, you know, how there's not an excuse for, for lack of hustle, we, you know, when we're on the bench, what would I expect for the players to do, how they're going to dress? I go through all of that, you know, belts on, hats on the right way. Don't put your hand on backwards. I mean, I'm sure you're going to agree with me on that, Dave. Do not put your Absolutely. hand on backwards. So I'll, I'll go through all of that. And then I will go through, believe it or not, the, the, the section that I go through that describes the coach's roles and responsibilities is much more in depth. I want them to know what they should expect from the coaches. Well, that's good because again, you want to set the table uh, so that they know there's no question. Here's what we're going to be looking at. Here's what we're going to be doing. And then quite frankly, it's also their opportunity to I hate to put this in a negative connotation, but kind of call you out if you're not doing the things that you say that you're going to do. And I, as, as a coach, as a manager, whatever, again, personal, professional life, I have no problem with that whatsoever, as long as it's a fair criticism. So in other words, if you set up that you're going to have, you know, two practices a week, every week, and you wind up canceling practice all the time, you should be expect to be called out on something like that. And conversely, I'm sure you don't have in there anything about, I will be working one-on-one -on -one with each and every individual player to, you know, at, at every <laughs> practice to make sure that they can excel at the, as a pitcher or, you know, whatever the case may be. So, you know, you're setting, it's setting the expectation. It's something that some of the teams that I've been involved with as a parent, and again, this is where you and I have, different perspectives because I have just been a parent on multiple teams uh, that my kids have played on through the years at, at times where the expectations, they, they did not live up to the expectations. Right. Um, they were, you know, we're told all of these things that are going to happen. And then when they don't happen, then you, you just like a player, we want the players to be held accountable. We, we as coaches have to be held accountable for that. Right. Well, we've we've talked about whether you're a paid coach, you're, you're a volunteer coach. If you're doing this in youth baseball, you, you, you have a job to do. You have to be also held accountable for what you're supposed to be doing. So if you lay out, like like we just said, what they could expect from you then follow it through. Right. And I think this even falls through, like you just said, even on a volunteer coach basis. So while we're talking primarily about the little bit older kids with um, school ball and travel ball, this falls all the way down the line to Little League and and Cal Ripken. You know, again, we kind of use Little League as the catch all for that age. Uh, but town ball, I think it falls back onto there as well. If, as you said, if you're going to volunteer to do this, don't go in with 50% effort, right? Uh, you know, go in and, and do the things. Here's what, what we're going to set up to do. Here's what our goal is to accomplish by the end of the year. And, you know, make sure you're working towards that at all times. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm just looking, I'm just looking at my outline and it's funny because I, ne I never realized it until now that under coach's role and responsibility, my number one bullet point, is communication. That's the first thing that I lead with. And it says basically, and coaches, this is part of the communication. So listen to this closely, convey our ideas and instructions to our players. Communicating does not just mean that we will only talk, we will also listen. And that's key. Sure, because otherwise, it's just it's not communication, it's dictation. Correct. And those are two entirely different things. Correct. So, 
you know, this is something that I believe all coaches should do, set the tone. A big part of this meeting is explaining to parents what is expected from them in terms of their behavior. You know, I, I, we all talk about in the baseball world now, we talk about culture. And I'm not exactly sure that everybody understands what it means. And I know that I always believe that the culture is set by me and is enforced by me. The culture is something that I believe our team should be doing and the way we should be acting. And that's the way I promote it. And the parents need to know what that culture is in terms of, and again, we've talked about this a million times, interacting with umpires, just period, don't do it. Interacting with me, I will go through what I expect and, and how we do that opposing coaches, opposing players, because let's face it, we're in a world right now, and, and you and I see it all the time in social media, you know, bat flipping, uh, um, trash talking other teams, and that Sc type of screaming into, yeah, screaming into the dugout, flipping the bird to the other team, right? You, you know, going around the bases, all that nonsense, right? You pull a stunt like that on my team, and I can guarantee you that there's going to be repercussions for that. So I make those type of things clear how we will act basically. And again, this goes back to the Matheny manifesto. I want parents to be a silent source of encouragement for the players and basically clap. That's what I want you to do. Clap. That's it. Right. All positive. You cheer us on. You should have, as you said, no interaction with the umpires, no interaction with the other team other than still as support. You know, if a, Certainly, if a player gets hurt or something like that, then uh, no, no issue with showing uh, solidarity and support for the other team. But it's, it's all positive for our team. Let the other team do what they do. Exactly. Uh, again, we'll, you know, I know I've said this many times, but simple, very simple thing. Num well, two simple things. Number one, you are what you allow. And number two, we live in our dugout. We have our way of doing things. That's what we do. We are not influenced by the other team. That's it. Yep. So, all right. So this is, um, so this is all in, in the preseason. I know for me personally, I would like to see this done really as soon as possible. If it's a, uh, if it's a, a travel team, uh, it, as a travel team, it should almost be put out before tryouts to me, because, you know, you don't want to have the team selected and sitting there with the first group. And all of a sudden a parent starts hearing something that, that they disagree with, which quite frankly, if they disagree with any of the things on here, there's somebody that you probably don't want around anyway. You stole and my the words. example. Yeah. The, the example I'll give you with that is uh, as far as communication, one of the teams I was involved in, the head coach had a policy, uh, no talking to the coaches immediately after a game in terms of you kind of critiquing what happened during the game with their players, whether it be playing time or positions or, you know, whatever, why did you do this? Nothing for 24 hours after a game. And we had a parent that wouldn't sign it. Wow. And it was like, okay, okay. I, I'd rather find out on day one than, you know, on day 20 or, or whatever, that this is clearly going to be a problem because what rational person has an issue with that? Right. Yeah. You want right. <laughs> That's something that I won't understand. I mean, if, you know, to your point, if that person wouldn't sign it, hey, thank you very much. We appreciate you coming to the tryout. I don't think this is the place for you. Maybe you should try another team. Done. Yeah. Yeah. So it's something that, yeah, definitely needs to be done. Kind of, uh, like I said, almost almost at, at tryouts, if not immediately after, before kind of the first check is cut. Um, right. that's, that's what I believe. Because again, you want to set the table, make sure no surprises with anything. From a school ball perspective, different different thing should still be done right after tryouts. No reason to do it ahead of time, really, because it's not like they can go play for another team, although they could certainly decide that they don't want to play under these rules. Uh, so I would I would hate to cut a kid and keep it, you know, keep another kid that then that kid or that kid's parents decide that this isn't for them, uh, which, again, kind of seems ridiculous knowing the things that are on there. It's not like we're saying you're going to run a hundred miles a week or anything like that in this <laughs> outline. But so again, I, I just think overall, the earlier you can get this out to the team, the better. Do you have the, the, 
players or the, and or the parents like sign anything like acknowledging that they've seen it or you just go over it? Because I've seen it both ways. You're, you're talking about with, with my high school team. Either way. Well, high school the, travel. The travel team, I know for sure that, yes, they have to sign a code of conduct. There, there's, you know, agreements that have to be made. Then with my high school, believe it or not, I'm not sure. I think there is, but everything there goes through the athletic athletic department. So I, I, and I, I would bet money that there's something that has to be signed that says I agree to the code of conduct and, and all of that. Okay. Yeah, I know with, uh, with the team that I was coaching this year, as much as we had conversations with the kids, we did not have a, a team conversation um when my child was playing in high school that coach the the varsity coach did have a parent meeting where he went over certain things i didn't care for a lot of i don't know if i should say a lot i didn't care for some of his attitude in regards to the the rules that he was setting up i'm curious Um, why so this is where and this is where i think you and i are gonna uh diverge (laughs) on certain things so, and, and we can, we can get into this now. This it's fine. So this is, and again, I have a different perspective of not being a coach, just being a dad in the stands. So one of the rules was that coach will not speak to the parents in regards to what happens on the field. Not going to talk about playing time, not going to talk about positions with the, with the parents. I understand to a degree and having, also been on the other side of that proverbial fence as the, as the coach, but from the parent perspective, and we say, you know, we want our kids, they need to start speaking up for themselves. They need to be adults and speak up for themselves. And I agree with that. I am very much a belief of making your kids self-sufficient to some degree at that age. But if they're not able to get the answer a satisfactory answer in terms of the whys, then what's the alternative? Is just some resentment building up on behalf of the player and the parent? I think to just draw a line in the sand and say, period, I am not going to have this conversation. I think it's a, I think it's a mistake. And I think it sets, I think it sets a very poor tone. And I feel like, and no offense to you directly on this, obviously, but I, I feel like it's it's a major ego move. And I think it's it's a it's a puffing my chest out. I'm the boss, too bad, so sad, don't like it, don't show up. Okay. And, and, I, and I and I think it's a rough, I think it's a rough attitude to have anytime we're talking. We're still talking about kids, young adults, but we're still talking about kids here. Okay, so. Yeah, and, and, and you've said this before, that this is an area where, where you and I disagree, because I look at it this way with my high school team. First of all, what purpose does that conversation serve? In other words, what I mean by that is a parent comes to you and what, whatever the issue is, playing time, playing position, whatever it may be related to on-field activities, are you really going to let a parent influence you what you're doing? Oh, it's not about letting a parent influence you. Okay. It's more about giving the ex- giving giving them the information that they might need to make sure so give me an example to, like to what? correct to to put their to put their child in a better position to succeed. Okay? So in other words, if a parent comes up and says and so this happened to us this year where a parent, it was an email, which is, which is fine in this day and age. I mean, you know, whatever right. uh, conversation, email, who cares? Doesn't understand why their player is not getting the opportunity that other players on the team are getting. And it was obviously more involved than that. I don't have a problem answering that because I know what the answer is because I, and, and it, we have a justification for that. And it's your player has gotten every opportunity that every other player has gotten in practice and has not shown the desire or the ability to move up to the next level, to claim 
a starting spot. And that's it. That's okay, not so going to, that, that's not going to make me go and start their player the next, the next game or anything like that. But I think but, that I, you know, I think they have, I think they have the right. I think they have the right to hear the truth, whether they like it or not. And keep in mind, that's what a lot of this is going to boil down to. They're not going to like the answers that they get. most of the time. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, you know, why is the player not playing? It's never going to be, I don't like the kid. Right. right. It's, of course not. it's always going to be because either statistics or attitude or effort, or generally some combination of all three, because they tend to field off of one, one another. Right. So, so why can't you have that conversation with the player? Why does the parent need to be involved? Now, I'm just going to preface that by saying on the travel side, I understand there's money involved. They're paying. So you owe them an explanation of what's going on. You also owe them, my opinion, is if they're on that team, that you owe them a certain amount of playing time. And the way I and 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 in that preseason meeting, it's it's spelled out to parents. I do it by plate appearances. I guarantee them X amount of plate appearances, which translates to their playing time. So let's put that travel aside for a second, mm -hmm. uh, so I, because there I get it. I understand the explanation on the high school side. I don't have a problem telling the player that, and I will tell him what he needs to work on and w whatever it is, whatever the issue may be, I don't have a problem talking to the player about it. I just don't think that talking to the parent will solve anything because to, to your point, are they going to like the answer you give them? No, they're, they're, no matter what you say, they're not, they're going to disagree with you. And maybe it is a little egotistical, but I, I have to say that I think I know what I'm looking at a lot more than, you know, a, a, a player's parent. Absolutely. And that's, but that's a, a bigger part of the point is keep in mind with school ball, especially the parent has only their child's, story and i don't mean to say story in terms of it's made up they only have the child's recanting of what's been going on in terms of practice you know parents are never seeing practice right 99.99 percent of the time they're not seeing anything in practice maybe the last two minutes if your kids are younger and the parents are coming to pick up the kids um but for overwhelming majority they're not able to see what's going on there so they're relying on their player, on their child to tell the story of, well, what's been going on there? Okay, you're not getting opportunity in games. What's, that's my first question is, well, what's going on during practice? Are you, are you goofing off during practice? Are you, are you doing things that you need to do? How have you been performing in practice? What is your coach telling you in practice that you need to work on? Well, now – some some players are going to be very good with communicating that back to back to the parents, but I think the overwhelming majority are not. So then that's where you start getting. I shouldn't be doing visuals. We're on a podcast here, but you start <laughs> you start getting you start getting the chatter, and you know the one parent who's buddy up with the other parent, and they start talking because neither one of their kids is getting the playing time, and then it starts to kind of grow, that festers and kind of grows. So for me, it's a way, as a, as a coach, it's a way to maybe ward some of that off by addressing it. Now, I'm not going to go out necessarily and, and say, hey, by the way, I just want to let you know, here's why your kid's not doing well. But if I'm asked the question, to be kind of offended that you're getting asked the question, to me is just, I, I, I can't get behind that mentality. Right. And that's almost what it's again, I'm not saying you specifically, I'm going off of my other experience with, with my, my son and, and the, the high school team where that was the coaches just flat out before the season. Don't even approach me about it. Not going to have the conversation to me. That's, that's absurd. As long as it's done in a respectful way of, Hey, my son says he doesn't, he asks during practice or he's asked, what does he need to do? He's not getting a good answer back in terms of anything constructive. So what does he need to do? And if you turn around and go, well, I've talked to him a hundred times about running on and off the field. I've talked to him about making sure he's hitting his cutoff, man, I, you know, whatever, blah, 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 whatever the, the things are going on now as a parent, now I can go, okay, great. 
now I'm out. And now I'm going to talk to my child because if they're not communicating to me accurately, what's going on, well, that's between him and I. Now, again, all these conversations can be very, very tough, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't have them. Well, I don't, I don't even see them as being tough conversations, to be honest with you. But again, it, here, yeah, here. Look at a parent, look at a parent in the eye and telling them their kid sucks. It's, it's, well, it's not <laughs> but let's face it. I would never say that. Neither would you. I know. I know. <laughs> but what I'm getting at is if, first of all, if a player approaches a coach and says, hey, coach, why am I not playing? I, in a heartbeat, I sit the kid down and we will have a conversation. I will tell him. Now, if he can't convey that to mom and dad, then I look at it like that's not my problem. That's between you and your son or your daughter, if we happen to have a girl on the team. But that's that's not my issue. My issue is this is my player. I'm going to talk. And the other thing, too, I wanted to get into a little bit was what you were just saying before about hustling and you know, not hitting. Those are the easy ones. Those are the real easy ones. Okay. Because you, you, you have concrete answers for them. What about you have two players that are very similar? Well, I won't say very, are perceived as being very similar in ability and performance. Okay. Now you're the coach, you know, that one guy um, is, you know, we'll use pitchers. One guy hits the spots better. One guy has a little bit better run on his ball, whatever. And he, there's that, the, 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 we'll say the minutia of the game that most parents don't know. I don't think you want to get into an explanation to try and explain all of that stuff to a parent that, you know, you, you understand what I'm saying? The easy stuff is, is piece of cake. He doesn't hustle. He doesn't hit the cutoff. Every time he throws the ball from third base to first base, he air mails him and the ball winds up in the stands, hitting an old lady in the head. Those are easy. But what about when, when it's similar and the parent won't understand what you're telling? Do you want to have that conversation? I don't. No, but you, you should be able to. I should. You're but... Because you're, you're making the, you are making the decision. Okay. And maybe I break this down. You know, I don't know. Maybe I'm a little too bleeding hard or something on this. And because I have been on the other side of the, of the fence, but Again, there to me, there shouldn't be an issue. Now, keep in mind, I'm not talking about a daily conversation, a daily update. No, I know. I'm talking about I'm talking about you know you're eight or twelve games in, and here's what here's what I'm seeing as a parent. What are you seeing as a coach? If you can't communicate those kinds of things, then that's something that you need to work on as a coach. Again, I'm not saying you specifically. Right. I think you have the experience to to do it, but you're saying but you are saying that you don't feel like you should have to, um, uh, you know, it's, I have a little bit of an, I, I have a little bit of an issue with that because where you say, well, with travel team, you're, you're paying. So because the parents paying, you put, well, in this case, okay, they're not paying directly, but they also don't have an alternative. They don't have I, another place that they can go. And so I, I, we, so we need to make this work and what's the best way to make this work to have an adversarial relationship with the parents? Probably see, not. You see, I, I, don't, I don't see it as adversarial or, or not. I just think that it's, like I said, when, when, when you get into the, um, the finer reasons why you're playing one player over another, most parents will not understand it. They won't see it. They're going to disagree with you. And I think that you're almost you're almost putting your, yourself in a position to be adversarial. Whereas if you just leave it alone, then it, it, you know, again, like you said, it's, it's my decision. And the parents should understand that, that it's, it's, it's my decision, right, wrong, or indifferent. It's still my decision. I could be totally wrong. I mean, I could be putting a kid out there that has two left feet because I'm seeing it that way. Why should I be questioned on, on my decision? People that know a lot about baseball are the people that put me in a position that I'm in. Do, do you understand? Or, or I, I do, I do, but I, I, I don't think because I don't know, maybe it's because you haven't seen it from the other side. You're creating ad, adversarial situation by not addressing it. And you can think that you're not, but I can tell you from experience, it does. Yeah. Because now, because I, because I don't know, I would rather know the answer and disagree with it 
than not know it all. Now that's me. Again, I shouldn't necessarily hold myself out as the average parent either. Right. Okay. Because a, I like to think I know a little bit more than the average parent. Um, I'm also, I think a lot more rational than the average parent (laughs) that we see, (laughs) especially these days. Um, So, you know, so I I do have to take a little bit of a, a step back from that and the coach can't dictate who he's going to talk to and who he's not going to talk to because that's a good parent. That's a bad, not bad parent, but you well, know what I'm saying? That's different. So, yeah. So, you know, you can't say, Oh yeah. Okay. This is a guy who's, who's been around. Now, if my kid was on your team, I'd like to think you wouldn't have any issue having the conversation with me about what the situation was, but you can't make that, you can't, draw those lines as a coach. If you're going to, you, you know, you either have to be open to the conversation or not open to the conversation with the parent. You can't pick and choose who you have it with. Um, just like with the player, you can't just say your superstars are okay. They can come five minutes late. They can, you know, whatever. Obviously there's certain policies that have to be blanket across. So again, I, and, and I, I think by opening the door, like I said, a, I think sometimes just letting a parent vent a little bit, can help to alleviate some of the pressure. Uh, and then you may not hear from them again for the entire season, but you also may not have them sitting there on the sidelines chirping away either. So, well, and now that's something maybe you don't care about as a, as a high school coach. And I'm not saying that like you're a heartless guy. I know that you're not, but you are putting up that wall of just, this is, I'm just, I'm not going to have that conversation. And I'm not telling you, you need to change either. I'm not saying what I'm my philosophy on it is the right way to do it. I'm saying from a parent perspective, I would, I would rather feel like there was some mutual respect back and forth where you had enough respect for me as the kid's parent to say, okay, Hey, I've talked to little Johnny about this three times. Obviously it's not getting through. So here you go. Here's what he needs to do. Okay. Okay. Now, if the parent keeps coming back at you after that, that's a different case. You have the right to shut that conversation down. Absolutely. You know, you, you, you should not be spending, you you should not be having the calendar, your, 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 your parent time uh, as, as part of your practice time. No way. Absolutely not. There's a reasonableness. There's kind of the reasonable test that has to be passed with this stuff. Um, So that's all that I'm saying is that, um, to have that conversation once and then maybe a check in later in the season of, you know, have you been seeing any increase, any improvement? Is it getting any better? If it's not getting any better. Again, my mentality, I'm going back to my kid and saying, okay, I don't want to hear it. Right. If you're not working hard in practice and you're not doing it, you're not, you know, I, I'm watching during the game. I see you're not, you're not going out and coaching first or you're not warming up the right fielder or you're not doing whatever. I don't want to hear it. Right. Right. You're telling me you, you're telling me you don't want to play. That's fine. Now, again, I'm not the typical parent. Right. But right. You, but I think you have to. I think you have to let give them the opportunity to disappoint you before you just assume that the, they're <laughs> going to disappoint you. I guess that's that's kind of where my my mindset is with that. Right. And, and, and I'm also going to go in, in another direction here with this, where. I think your actions sometimes can speak louder than words. And I think that that could alleviate a lot of what happens in terms of parents not understand where you're coming from. And and what I mean by that is on my teams, and I know a lot of coaches don't do this, I don't care who you are. I don't care what ability you have. I don't care if you're my, my leadoff hitter who's batting 500. Okay, If you don't do what you're supposed to do, you're going to find yourself being held accountable for it. And that means not getting on the field. And I know that my parents from my high school team see that because again, they know who's obviously who's the kid who's been batting, whatever, again, in, in, the, in the one spot, you know, all season. And wow, this kid is, Hey, why is he on the bench today? You know? And then they'll ask their little John, Hey, why was so-and-so on the bench? Well, you know, he did something coach didn't like that. Da, 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 da. He sat him. So I think that those type of actions also tell parents that, hey, he's not singling out my kid. He's being fair across the board. And if if things aren't going right, no matter who it is, this is the way it is. And I I I mean, I'm not saying that's all the time, but I'm saying that that also plays into it. Oh, absolutely. 
I mean, that's, that's, and that again, goes back to the beginning where we were talking about setting up the expectations at the beginning of the season, that it's not just all about the, you know, the wins and losses. It's not all about the on-base percentage and, and whatnot. It's also about how you conduct yourself and carry yourself and, and whatnot. And I mean, from, especially at the JV level, I mean, every kid needs to sit because they not, they're going to be sitting next year, probably, you know, right. they're, when they're going, they're going back to being the, you know, right now they're big fish in a little pond and then they're going to go into the bigger, bigger pond. Um, so they, you know, they have to be able to deal. And you talk about this, you know, multiple different ways with dealing with adversity and dealing with failure and whatnot. And they have to learn how to, how to deal with that stuff. So yes, um, setting up those expectations and then following through on them, both in the positives and the negatives is that's a key component to getting, right. getting your message across to the team. Right. And I, like I said, I, I also think that that alleviates a little bit of that unknown that the parents may have. But, you know, I think that and, and, and maybe we should move on from here because we're, we're kind of beating a dead horse. I guess if I had to summarize my way of thinking about it is that JV level. And again, I know that your situation is different than mine because my players are older. Hey, it's it's time to start teaching them to become a young man. And I'll, I'll explain to the players all day long what they need to work on, why they're not in the lineup, how I'm going to get, I've talked to players about how I'm going to get them into the lineup. I think it was Coach Chaffin when we had him on, he said that he tries to get all of his players in every game, whether it be in a bunt situation, a you know base running situation. I do the same thing. I try, but there are certain instances, and I'll just use as an example, when maybe you have a catcher who's slow, can't bunt, and is bad defensively as a catcher, it's going to be hard to get him into a game. Right. You know, it's, it's hard. But now people could turn around and say, well, why'd you take him on a team? Well, and, and a catcher is a good position because there's not a lot of them. So it's, it's, right. it's a good example to use. Sometimes you have to take somebody as a backup that maybe he's not really up to par, but if you're, your, your uh, starting catcher gets hurt, you may need him for that role. Oh yeah. You can't go into a season. Yes. I mean, you, you have to have those role players. You're going to have, you're going to have a couple of arms um, at the end of the bench that probably are not going to get a lot of innings, but you have to have them there. Um, you know, you get a couple of rainouts like we had this year and all of a sudden you're playing four or five games a week for a couple of weeks. Basically, if you've ever thrown a ball before in your life, you got a chance <laughs> at, at hitting the mound that yeah. week. <clears throat> And then, uh, you know, catchers certainly. So yeah, there are some, some players that um, there is a little bit of, there is a little bit of know your role when it comes to some of these guys. Uh, and again, I think setting up uh, the expectations up front goes a long way on that. Uh, it, it doesn't go the whole way because players will still complain. Even, you know, you have somebody you explain to them. I'm sure you've been in this position. We were, we've been in this position where it's like, Okay, you're 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 clearly number two at best, if not number three at this position. There's really not another position that you can play. We'll get you in when we can, but it's it's gonna be it's gonna be tough. You're gonna have to you're gonna really have to step it up during the season. And sometimes kids respond to that. Yes. And 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 they do. Unfortunately, a lot of times they either don't or can't because they're just they're just not, they just don't have that talent. Right. Um, and it, it's just not there. So yeah. And that, that, that gets, that gets tough. Um, that gets tough when you're going on week after week. Uh, but that's, you know, that that's part of real life and that I don't have a problem with, uh, you know, again, I'm not, I've been accused through my coaching career at different times because of some of the topics that I bring up, I'm like, Oh, he wants everybody to have equal playing time. And I'll, you know, that's never been the case. It's right. adequate playing time. Right. Adequate playing time right. for what you bring to the table. Right. And again, that's not just the physical aspect of it. It's the mental aspect of it and the effort and, and attitude and all that. But um, but regardless. Yeah. So. All right. So. Um, so we talked about preseason. We talked about. So during the season, um, generally speaking with the players, I mean, I'm sure there could be a situation where you go, listen, I, I'm not having the same conversation I had with you two days ago. Right. With, I mean, with, with, with a player, even with the player. Yes, I mean, yes. you know, there's, there's, there's getting carried away with it. And I'm sure that's few and far between, but I could see it happening. 
maybe not two days ago, but last week or whatever. Right. Um, so now you're going through the season. You're we're in constant communication with the players, both one on one as a group um actions in terms of you know getting getting a player when you see them making strides getting them some extra at bats um and that that does seem to be the common theme from what i've seen on the the teams is it's it's more about the at bats than the innings right um in terms of quote unquote playing time uh you know we can use a dh so sometimes we will and there's a way to you know kind of kill two birds with one stone there get somebody some extra at bats while the other player is getting the innings in the field um i don't know how much you use a dh on uh on your teams how you feel about that philosophy that's i guess that's more a topic for a day yeah time. well i mean I, I could sum it up real quick i believe that whenever a kid is pitching that we he shouldn't hit however as <laughs> lately my teams haven't been very good hitting teams and usually the guys who pitch are my better hitters. So I've gotten away from it, but my, my, I, I I'm only doing that out of necessity. So that to right. answer your question, I believe that we should use a DH. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we, we saw this a lot of the same. It was tough where we were, uh, we were DHing for some position players over the pitcher just because, you know, when again, hits, hits are, uh, coming in dribs and drabs, you, you gotta, you gotta put your best foot forward with that. Right. Um, you know, doesn't, doesn't do your pitcher any good to throw a, uh, uh, you know, a no hitter and lose. Right. <laughs> right. You know, so, right. but, um, okay. So how about, um, let's move to kind of end of the season postseason. So again, here's where there's a dramatic difference between travel and high school, as much as I was joking around before I really wasn't you know, the, the, the summer season of travel ends and it's literally typically the next weekend that fall ball starts. Right. So not a lot of opportunity there to, uh, to kind of recap and set up, but for school ball, there's a much bigger thing. Do you, do you try to do any type of a formal one-on-one with each player? Do you do just a kind of a end of the year group meeting? Like how, how do you handle that? I I do one-on-one. Well, with my travel, it's a uh, one on two. (laughs) (laughs) When I do with the travel, I have the parent there. I want the parent to hear what I'm saying to the player. Reason being that in that situation, there's money involved, there's lessons, there's training that is being paid for. I want the parents to hear what I believe the player needs to work on and, and what's going on with my high school. I just meet with each player individually and, you know, it's really not anything too formal. It's five, 10 minutes of most. Well, I shouldn't even say mostly it's 100% positive. This is what I saw trying to give them all of the good things to build them up and let them know, all right, look, we could use a little work here. We could use a little work there, but on the most, this is what I like. This is what I saw. And I think that you'll be fine if we tweak these other things. And it's that type of conversation. Yeah. And I, I think that's, I think that's great. And I think it's very important. Um, It's something that we kind of missed out on this year. Uh, Not kind of, we, we missed out on this year the way that the season ended with a couple of rainouts and things, we didn't really have a great opportunity to have a, uh, you know, like our, our season didn't end. It kind of slowly <laughs> came to a, to a halt. So we had a hard time scheduling. We were trying to schedule. We, we picked multiple days and times. We were trying to do something with the team, just do something fun, get together. We did wind up doing, uh, doing something where we, we played like some football and some wiffle ball. We had about, I don't know, we had uh, maybe 11 out of 14 kids that were able to, to come. So we, we weren't able to do more of a formal or informal sit down with each player. Like I, um, I really think it would have been good to do, uh, especially the ages that we have. We had primarily eighth and ninth graders on our team. So aside from the baseball aspect of it, it's just the general um, physical fitness aspect that I really wanted to get into. You know, we had one of the kids who uh, one of our eighth graders who was really wound up being one of the more talented kids, but he's, he's tiny. And I don't, I don't mean 
height wise, uh, you know, width, width wise, you know, this right. kid, you know, he, he needs, he needs to work out. He, if he could put on 15 pounds of muscle between now and next year, uh, which is easily attainable with any type of just basic program. Uh, I, I, I think it would do wonders for this kid. So, you know, and, and there was, there was a lot of things like that, that I, I would, would have liked to have sat down and, and gone over with them. And it, we just, we just wound up not really having the opportunity to, but like I said, something keeping positive, here's what we saw. Here's what we saw you grow with during the year. Uh, here's what, you know, you're going to be 90% of the kids, 95% of the kids are going to be playing some kind of travel ball. So here's, if, if you have the opportunity, here's really what you need to work on to get ready for next year, you know, this, this, and this, and then, you know, the nutrition and the physical fitness aspect of it. That's another big part of it. Yeah. That, that exact conversation, well, well, that what you just mentioned was part of my conversation was this summer. I want to see you working on this, 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 and you know, I'll even explain to them that, you know, and maybe this is the wrong way to do it, but the, during the summer, I, I, I don't want you to be so much concerned about your batting average, your on-base percentage, your this, your that, because let's face it, one of the things that I see that the kids need to work on most is their hitting. So I'll tell them that, listen, this summer, go out there, work on the things that we talked about this spring. And try and refine your batting and don't worry so much about your batting average or on base percentage, all of that stuff. Work on your hitting, just work on your hitting and see what happens. You're going to, and I explain it to them, you know, you're going to go through a period where, you know, you're not going to hit the ball well, but you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And this is going to help you in the long run. Now, whether or not it sinks in and they actually do that during the summer, I'll find out in the spring when I see right. him again. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I mean, and and it's it's tough because you know, some of these some of the kids, depending on their level and the the team that they wind up playing for, teams that they wind up playing for, they may not have a lot of ind- individual time to work on things. Right. Um, you know, a kid that looks like he's got the basic talent where he maybe he could be. I mean, I'm sure your team, much like ours, anything with with school ball, especially JV level, you have a high turn, excuse me, a very high turnover rate from one year to next in terms of your starters, typically, um, where you can go, you know, maybe six out of the nine starting positions. You're looking at new starters next year. You know, I I would say somewhere around that. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's almost the whole team. Right. So just even that idea to talk to these players and just be like, listen, okay, I understand you didn't get the opportunity this year that you were hoping for. It's wide open next year. So that in mind, if you can work on this, this, and this, I could see you being our starting third baseman next year, or I could see, you know, whatever. But then when they get back to their travel team, maybe they don't even have the opportunity to do that there either, uh, where, you know, some of the teams are, they, they have their rule of it's not little league. There's no mandatory playing time. You get what you get and too bad. Mm. And, you know, they go from a, a, you know, a good opportunity to no opportunity. It's tough the way some of the, some of these programs are run, you know, you've seen it, you, mm-hmm. you hear the stories. So uh, I guess long winded point there is they still have to be able to do the things on their own. Like you talked about hitting. And I'll say that I'll tell the kids, you don't need somebody throwing you batting practice. You don't even need a T just work on your stance and just work on your stance and your swing. Yeah. You know, if you can set, set up a mirror and get in there and work on short to the ball, you know, short step hands, hands to the ball, turn to pop the hips. You can do that a hundred times. You don't need anybody throwing you soft toss or anything like that to work on those things. Those things you can do on your own. Cause again, most of these travel teams, they're not going to spend individual time with the players right they're just not right but i i i want to go back to something that you were just talking about i i don't know i i think maybe you misunderstood what i said or maybe i didn't say it right but my i don't get the players back so in other words when i have that end of the year talk and that end of the year communication with my players that conversation is to hopefully get through to them so that they make varsity next year 
because I, I can't say to a player, do this and you may get this spot back on my, they're not going to be there. You know what I'm saying? The whole team turns over like that this year. I'll have uh, four kids returning. That's it. Out of wow. 20, out of 20. Oh, okay, because, so, because so again, my, totally different scenarios, right? It's, it's different. I'm just trying to prepare my whole um, existence as a JV coach is to try and prepare them for varsity. I don't get a lot of freshmen. My first year, I had one freshman. My well, then there was because of the COVID, things got screwed up. But right. again, this year, I only had four freshmen, so I have four kids coming back. That's it. Right. And, and that's that. That's the difference of this of the program where you have a freshman team, a JV team, and a varsity team, whereas we have a JV and a varsity with no freshman team, and you know half of our team was freshmen, which most of them are probably going to be pulled up next year, but we did have half our team was actually junior high players. So there's a couple of them that'll be pulled up and then we'll have the rest of them back. So again, different, different perspective on that. Right. And, and the other thing too, to understand is that when I do pull, I think we had this conversation that when I pull a freshman up, when I take him, you know, after tryouts, chances are they're going to be in my starting lineup or they're not coming. I think we had talked about, I had made one mistake with one of my players that I pulled up a freshman and to, to it fits in perfect with this conversation where that uh, meeting that we had at the end of the season, I sat him down and I told him, I said, I, I owe you a big apology. I said, because I made a mistake and you suffered for it. I should have left you down on freshman. You weren't ready. And you came up and you didn't get that much playing time. I said, I'm going to tell you something. I said, that goes against everything I believe in. I said, but I just want you to know that I know what I did. I'm accountable for it. And I apologize. And, you know, there's, there's nothing else I could do. I made a mistake. But the oh, other, and that's, I mean, that that's going to happen as long as it's, it's not the regular, like you said, it's, it's, it's a mistake. It's a, it's an isolated incident. As long as it's not a regular occurrence, then no, you can't, you can't kill yourself for that. There's, there's players that show well in the gym and just don't show well on the field. It right. happens. Right. And, but again, the, the other three, like I said before, the other three freshmen I pulled up, they started, they, they, right. so they're going mostly, I mean, and, and believe I, in my conversation with them, I told them, I said, don't think that because you started as a freshman on JV, that, if you come back to me next year, that that spot is yours. You have to earn it again because sure. there might be another freshman that comes along that might beat you out. <laughs> and, you know, it's something that they need to know. I'm not going to, I don't want to lie to them. That's the truth. No, no, they have to learn. They have to learn those life lessons. That's, that's part of the harsh reality there, but um, okay. So, all right. So I, I think this was a very good conversation in terms of, what we do, the t different types of things that we've seen through the years in terms of how you handle your team and, and some of the teams that I've seen, whether, you know, handling it myself or being on the, the other side of the fence as a, as a parent. Curious to get some feedback from uh, those of our, our listeners out there. Let us know what you think about the conversations. If you're, if you're a parent, if you're a coach, how are you handling these types of things? Are you setting up the expectations correctly? Uh, properly in the beginning of the season how much communication are you having with the team as far as the players and or the parents regardless of what level that you're at let us know you can reach out to us on twitter at the ctb show uh email is clearing the bases at gmail.com we'd love to hear from you guys uh our listenership as always has just been going up and up and up we are way ahead of where we would have predicted that we would have been in terms of total total listeners at this point in our illustrious career of podcasting and uh you know jimmy and i you know, we love it uh, we're gonna keep bringing you things we've got some really really awesome guests lined up coming up over the next couple of weeks very very excited about that if you have somebody that uh, looks interesting you have something uh, topics that you want to, us to cover, please reach out and let us know. We're happy to discuss it, whether it's a, sometimes it's a five minute thing. It's almost never a five minute thing for us, <laughs> but sometimes, sometimes it's a five minute thing. Sometimes it's a whole show and that's where we get some of the ideas for the show. So uh, very um, excited to hear back from all you guys. Let us know what you think about today's show. 
Um, anything else you wanted to finish up with in terms of team communication, Jimmy? No, I, I mean, I, I, I think that's it. You know, I think we covered everything, players, parents, just coaches. Just re- remember that there are ways to do it. That there, that there's obviously ways that I believe it should be done. And that's why I love these conversations that we have, because we're not always in agreement the way everything is, is supposed to be. But we, we present both sides and let the people listen and pick and choose what they believe is right and move forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so thanks again, everybody for tuning in. We appreciate all of our listeners each and every week that we do a show. We love hearing from you guys. Uh, Please keep in mind, the only two things we can control at all times are our effort and our attitude, hundred percent effort at all times, positive mental attitude, PMA, great things will follow. Final words, coach. Yeah. Just a little bit on, on communication again, before we end the show is that as a coach, that has to be one of your highest priorities. We, we talk about the way co- coaches communicate. And if you look back in history throughout the best coaches in any sport, all of these coaches have one thing in common. They all are great communicators. So, you know, I, we, we, Dave and I both believe that communication is a very, very important aspect of coaching. So do your homework, learn how to communicate, become a better communicator. I think if, if all coaches can uh, master, you know, this part of coaching, I, I think the whole youth baseball world will be a better place. So with that, I will leave you with people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care and communicate that. See you on the next one, everyone. Mm-hmm.